So uh, what does communication without representation look like? I want to sketch an answer today, and it will turn out looking a little impressionistic, maybe tentative, but nevertheless reflect a deep philosophical truth about the nature of communication and also about the nature of the thing that does the communicating, us, that is, human beings. When I say representational, I mean that these philosophies tend to view the basic mental capacities of human beings to be rooted in procedures wherein what we intend to say is cast in a representative mold in order to be communicated. So the representation transmits the information from sender to receiver, kind of way. Representation can be thought of as a mediator between the interior meaning that finds its ethereal life within the mental world of the subject and the outer world that appears to the subject yet remains distinct from it and always somehow independent or objective. And this describes really most of Western philosophy. Uh, Jean-Luc Nancy in his book The Birth to Presence says that all of Western thought is characterized by the representational schema, the appearance of some representation to some subject. So let me uh, just very briefly uh, review the relevant philosophical background where communication is commonly conceived as a, a basically cognitive act. Um, and that part may be true or at least part of the story, right? The representational procedure worked out between at least two communicators is a cognitive one. Uh, during the 20th century, analytic philosophers viewed the human mind as a kind of representational computation machine. Uh, computationalism in philosophy of mind makes full and thorough use of the representational schemes developed in modern philosophy by Descartes, Locke, Leibniz, Kant, the usual suspects, right? Um, one motivator of 20th century philosophical discourse about mind was a research program related to artificial intelligence and robotics. The publication of Alan Turing's Computing Machinery and Intelligence in the October 1950 issue of Mind marks a watershed event in the history of that research program. Mind increasingly began to be described as computing machinery, the brain supplying the hardware on which the Mind program would run as software whose function was representational at nature, the, re the manipulation of representations. Analytic philosophy of mind in the second half of the 20th century is marked by a struggle with computationalism and a turn toward the discourse of cognition and, of course, the emergence of cognitive science, right? By the end of the 1990s, the popularity of computationalism waned. Former advocates significantly altered their positions, uh, notably the computer scientist Terry Winograd. Uh, he had one of the most robust um, artificial intelligence programs in the 70s, but in the mid-80s, he totally changed course, said that cognition was not computational, it was actually interpretive, and um, offered Heidegger as like a philosophical paradigm. So interesting guy, Terry Winograd. Um, so that and then en engagements with cognitive science began opening possibilities of non-representational theories of mind, which is what we're driving at here. The heirs of Hillary Putnam's Twin Earth are poised to characterize the early 21st century as the age of externalism, inaugurated by Clark and Chalmers' 1998 essay, The Extended Mind, published in the 58th volume of Analysis. Following in the externalist uh, wake is a trend in research on cognition with a particularly existential phenomenological flavor, very surprising, uh, despite having overcome computationalism and its, attending, uh, and its attending reductionism, even verging on the discovery of non-representational theories of cognition, Philosophy of mind, nevertheless, remains attached to the research programs of artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, no better example, really, than uh, Andy Clark, whose 1997 book, Being There, makes obvious titular reference to the Dasein analysis of Heidegger's being in time, but he quickly drops any existential or phenomenological consideration after the first page to spend the next 228 discussing a dizzying array of robots and their various abilities. Um, so computational AI is replaced by the technology rejuven uh, robotics program. But, of course, we're neither computers nor robots, uh, and this isn't how we communicate. So how do we? I'm started down the road that leads away from representation by Alva Nua's excellent 2012 study, Varieties of Presence. Um, and I, I really have to be unfair here and just state plainly that the metaphysics of presence and the idea of representation are very closely intertwined. I, I highly recommend uh, Jean-Luc Nancy's book on this topic, but I have to forego a more rigorous discussion here. Um, in any event, Noah plainly writes, the idea, uh, quote, the idea that presence is representation is a bad idea, and argues accordingly that presence is not representational. 
Instead, presence is conceived as availability. Um, I want to follow Nui's suggestion that we consider presence here in terms of availability. And there's a strong resonance between Noah, who is an analytic philosopher, uh, Noah's account of presence as availability, and Heidegger's investigation of equipmentality in the analytic of Dasein. Um, Noah himself acknowledges the debt to Heidegger's being in time, but goes on to claim that the so-called existential phenomenologists, quote, don't go deep enough because they don't flat out deny the transcendental account that underpins representation, instead insisting that the transcendental account is a secondary one made possible by the pre-thematic world we are absorbed in and involved with during the course of everyday human events. So out of this engagement, reformulating presence in terms of availability, presence can be rethought to accommodate a new role for concepts, whose former function was exactly representational. Concepts used to represent things, no more. We have severed presence from representation. This frees concepts from laboring under the hopeless task of recreating a map or model of the world or object intended to be represented by the concept because the concept, as that which becomes present in thought, is no longer representative of anything. Indeed, there is no need for representation as, as far as Noah is concerned. Instead, we are to think of the concept as a tool by which we take hold of and grapple with the world that is presented to us. That move places Noah in a position very close to Heidegger when he uh, analyzes pragmata in paragraph 15 of Being in Time as that which always displays the structure of an in order to, uh, umzu in German. While it's true that Noah attempts to distinguish himself from Heidegger and the so-called existential phenomenologist, it is also true that he shares the existential idea that the concept is itself conditioned by the conjunction of the human being and the world, indeed that the meaning of the concept itself is conditioned by the interaction, the struggle, between the human being and the world it grapples with via the concept. Uh, I, I want to note here that Noah uses the term world in a way that's actually closer to how Heidegger uses the term earth in the later writings, uh, but that has to remain un undeveloped as well at this, uh, just due to time. So thus, both Noah and Heidegger seem to argue that human understanding is one, fundamentally interpretive, and two, that such interpretation is geared primarily for acting. Uh, part of the problem is that Noah's criticism of existential phenomenologists as relegating the transcendental account to a secondary position is somewhat wrongheaded. And since it's Heidegger who serves as Noah's most productive interlocutor on the issue, I take it that Heidegger is the primary target of Noah's criticism. And there are some grounds to make the claim that Noah does. For one, although Noah is admittedly almost completely unfamiliar with Heidegger's body of work, he cites mostly conversations that he has with Dreyfus about Heidegger uh, in his book. Um, in Contributions of Philosophy, Heidegger does claim that, quote, correctness is an unelectable scion of truth. Okay, so we have that. But if we understand correctness here to refer only to the correctness of the correlation between a representation and some object in the world, then Noah has an argument. However, uh, I mean, to me, it's clear that Heidegger doesn't mean correctness in the sense of a transcendental correlation between some representative concept and its object. If we return to paragraph 15 of Being in Time, we see that Heidegger attempts a radical reassessment of reference or assignment when he says that the, uh, that the structure of the in order to refers something to something. He does not mean that the in order to is a relation of correspondence between representational ideas and an object. Rather, he means that the in order to directs us to the world of equipment that gives whatever object we have at hand meaning through the series of relationships that exist between the object at hand and the equipment involved in the project enabled by the in order to structure. Heidegger's famous hammer uh, refers not from a representation of a hammer to some object called hammer, but instead to the other things that are involved in the world of carpentry, that is planers, planks of wood, nails, sandpaper, and so on. The relations between the hammer and these other bits of equipment underwrites the assignment of some meaning to the hammer. But it's not just these other bits of equipment that give the hammer meaning. It's also that, taken together as a totality of references, the collective noun equipment are all at the service of the in order to. That is, they are all tied together under the aegis of a practice. The in order to is geared for action. Uh, later in, in Being in Time, in paragraph 32, Heidegger makes it clear that we do not, quote, throw a signification over the naked thing which is on hand, for handen, technical term for Heidegger, we do not stick a value on it, end quote. 
This is perfectly in line with Noah's basic position that, quote, the detail of the appearance of a room show up as present in that I understand implicitly, practically, that the merest movement of my eyes and head, I can secure access to an element that is now obscured on the periphery of the visual field. And therefore, these um, details are not represented to me, but are rather made available uh, to me for acting. Uh, likewise, according to Heidegger, in my involvement with the hammer, I understand implicitly, practically, that by a series of movements coordinated with the equipment of carpentry, of which the hammer is a part, I can make available a table that is not currently available because I haven't made it yet. Right. Note, too, that Noah's conception of our conscious perception is a fundamentally relational one, as is Heidegger's, dependent as it is on human beings' involvement with the world and its totalities of reference. Um, all the above to say that Noah severely misreads statements such as Heidegger's about the ineluctability of correctness. Heidegger does not mean correctness understood transcendentally. Rather, he means correctness in the sense of calculative thinking. And while it's true that Heidegger claims calculative thinking, quote, makes things ever more representable, we cannot take him to mean representable here in a transcendental sense precisely because he believes that this representation makes things more available, that is, more accessible for manipulation in order to be put to use according to some plan. So for Heidegger, the representation of anything in the concept is one of the most concrete and practical importance, not some abstract practice of labeling something with a sign to give it significance and so on. Thus, Noah actually just talks past Heidegger because he fails to attend to the radical reinterpretation of representation that unfolds across several of Heidegger's works. Uh, this is particularly ironic considering that Noah's ostensive goal is to reimagine presence without getting rid of the word, and Heidegger just does that with representation. He doesn't get rid of the word, but he completely sort of reworks it and reformulates it. And my point is even further emphasized when we attend to Heidegger's understanding of concept, uh, begriffe. In a 1924 lecture on Aristotle, published as Basic Concepts of Aristotelian Philosophy, Heidegger claims that the conceptions themselves are concrete basic experiences and, quote, not a theoretical grasping of the matter. Later, in a 1929-30 lecture, published as Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics, Heidegger argues that we should not understand concepts, and especially not metaphysical ones, as anything like a determinative representation through which we set something before us in order to evaluate it or judge about it. Rather, concepts, and again, particularly metaphysical ones, arise from our being gripped by the world and struggling in this grip to understand the whole of our condition, thereby bringing ourselves as a part of the whole into question as well. Thus, concepts arise from a direct encounter with the world, a direct encounter that Noah is also trying to articulate in his work. Um, Heidegger keeps coming back to this 1941 lecture on the basic concepts, Grunbegriffe, a later lecture in 1954 on Leibniz and the principle of sufficient reason, a little bit even earlier than that in 47 at Bremen, just he keeps returning to it again and again. So how do we put this formulation of concepts into play? I call the emergent emergent theory of communication a field theory. Uh, because it relies on an understanding of the human perceptual field with it, which in which, uh, within which human beings encounter the world through a conceptual lens developed in an interchange between person and their environment, and through which the world becomes available to us in a sort of uh, ecology of mind, to borrow a phrase from Gregory Bateson. When two people come into community with one another, their personal fields of perception begin to overlap, and one person becomes capable of making alterations in the perceptual field of their interlocutor. Communication is thus achieved by the perturbance affected on the perceptual field of one person by another or others. When I communicate with another, I am, through the communicative act, generating the conditions necessary for the apprehension of the world through a mutually shared concept. This procedure, however, is never a determinative one. I facilitate communication through the alteration of the perceptual field only tentatively and with hope. I can make gestures, speak words, send a written message, or any number of communicative acts, and yet the ultimate outcome of my message is never vouchsafed by me, right? I'm not imposing a fixed form that just um, can be directly, uh, is determinative or causal in some way. What I hope is that I'm able to make the world available to the other in a way comparable to my own, geared towards similar ends, whether that end is a goal, the completion of a project, or just a discussion about a film, book, social situation, what have you. In short, I want to share a vision of the world by providing for my interlocutor the conditions for seeing the world as I see it through a concrete alteration in the perceptual field through which the world becomes available to them. 
So in closing, just note deeply sort of interconnected um, possibilities for this theory. And I don't really want to say intersubjective because uh, there's no subject and there's no ego. ego. There's just this uh, mutual sort of becoming. So uh, a sketch of the a possible new use for concepts in communication theory. Thanks.